University College of London. Political scientist Josephine Harmon can tell us the background. I think a key driver for Cameron was resolving conflict within his own party. This sense that the Tory party were Eurosceptic, there was a very vocal wing of the party which was pushing for some kind of uh, referendum on this issue. And I think that was a big part of his thinking. Uh, he said he was trying to resolve uh, the tension within uh, the party and put the issue to bed. Pressure also came from the right-wing fringe, from the UKIP. So UKIP is the UK Independence Party and it was founded uh, really to uh, push for a referendum on the UK's uh, membership of the EU. Uh, it's extremely Eurosceptic and it, it was essentially a single issue party which lobbied for years on that very issue led by Nigel Farage who was a very charismatic, very popular uh, far-right politician in the UK. Uh, and he, he gained a, a significant cultural following in the late noughties and early 2010s. Pre-referendum polls show that the weak economy with high unemployment and increasingly immigration were seen as the most important political issues. The supporters of leaving the EU took advantage of this and claimed that the EU was to blame, sometimes using propaganda methods. Um, Nigel Farage had his own campaign which was different from the, the main Leave campaign and he used much more immigration heavy, immigration hostile imagery including a large poster of uh, a queue of immigrants uh, purportedly trying to get into this country and this was uh, relating to the 2015 uh, Syrian uh, migrants crisis which was happening in Europe, the Flüchtlingskrise and I think this influenced public opinion in a big way. In the UKIP's campaign, the photo becomes a menacing flow of people that will hit British workers hard and turn them into beggars. Fear of cheap labour was one argument for leaving, but others were added. The campaign to leave also created this new word, sovereignty which people hadn't been speaking about with regard to the EU. And this was really a top-down political idea among Conservatives that the UK should be free to do whatever it wants and that uh, union uh, membership of, of the European Union was constraining political choice and democracy in the UK. So that was one of their key arguments and it ended up being very persuasive despite being quite abstract because it allows you to argue for a lot of different things within that argument, whether it be about agriculture and fishing and borders and immigration. So it was this kind of perfect package which summarised the Eurosceptic worldview. Conservative politicians and right-wing politicians were doing that for years. They would call it bonkers Brussels. And so there was this story about the bendy bananas, that the EU wouldn't allow bananas that weren't the right shape from being sold in the UK. And it was meant to be this metaphor for Brussels' um, sort of technocratic incompetence. Um, and that really filtered through the culture in a big way. The campaigns are taking hold, but hardly anyone notices at this point. More and more voters got carried away. There was also a Remain campaign, but it was fighting against the general mood. Josephine Harmon campaigned for Remain in the EU at the time. Um, it, we found that it was much harder to push a message that was in favour of the status quo. People were much more responsive to an argument that was about change and that was the biggest problem of the campaign throughout. The low point of the struggle comes a week before the vote on June 16, when a Leave supporter shoots Labour MP Joe Cox, who had a campaign for Remain. I think Joe Cox's murder was a reminder that things were getting quite serious and that there were real human consequences to that kind of political division and hostility. Three and a half years after Cameron's reckless announcement, the time has come. The UK will vote on June 23, 2016. Just under 51.9% are in favour of leaving. Even Nigel Farage had not expected it until the very end. Ladies and gentlemen, but at four o'clock in the morning, it seems clear. Dare to dream that the dawn is breaking on an independent, united kingdom. You know, there was some sense in which this could happen. But I don't think anybody really expected us to leave.
the EU. And it, it was a very sad thing for my generation who've grown up as part of Europe and feel European and, you know, feel that our European uh, friends are just like we are. You know, we're all part of the same team. This is the end of the first act of the political thriller Brexit. Cameron has gambled. It was certainly a gamble. I think he didn't realize how much of a gamble uh, it was. He's resigning. Theresa May takes on the difficult task of leading the country out of the EU. The second act of the Brexit drama will last three years. The negotiations are proving difficult. The British have benefited greatly from the free European market and they do not want to give that up. Prime Minister Theresa May keeps negotiating new treaties with the EU, which she must submit to the British House of Commons for a vote. This debate has lasted some eight days over 54 hours, with speeches of powerful sincerity from over 200 honourable and right honourable members. It has been historic for our Parliament and for our country. But whatever Theresa May puts before Parliament, it is rejected. She is humiliated by her Parliament at least four times. Of course, this House has voted on and rejected a second referendum. It has voted on and rejected no deal. It has voted on and rejected Labour's deal. It has voted on, it has voted on and rejected a customs union. The main bone of contention in all Brexit negotiations is Northern Ireland, which is the fourth country in the United Kingdom. Where should the EU's external border be located? In the Irish Sea between the islands of Great Britain and Ireland? Or on the island between the EU member Irish Republic and the British Northern Ireland? This is vehemently opposed by the Northern Irish, 60% of whom voted to remain in the EU. The agreement is finally reached on the EU's external border in the Irish Sea. The official exit date was January 31, 2020. But even then, the customs union continued to exist until the end of 2020. The actual exit did not take place until January 1, 2021. Andrew James Johnston, professor of medieval English literature at the Free University of Berlin. He is Scottish and German. When I first heard that the referendum was going to take place, I felt, I felt mildly confused, but I didn't think it would be a danger because at the time, most polls said that the Remainers would win, hands down. There was no real danger. And so I thought, if, if we have to go through with this process, so be it, but it won't really matter. But that was to change in the month leading up to the referendum. The outcome shows that Scotland, Northern Ireland, as well as Greater London, voted by a majority to remain in the EU. Yellow here. But in England and Wales, people were more likely to vote to leave. The arguments of the Leave campaigners obviously struck a nerve there. They had basically two types of arguments. Uh, Number one was uh, the fear of foreign labor. Polish, Romanian uh, people who were amongst the largest group of foreigners who had come in through Europe and who were seen as competitors on the labor market and also on the housing market. And the second one, the second reason for, or the second argument in favor of Brexit, which was a lie, a big lie, was that the British were handing over too much money to Europe and not really getting anything out of it. And that, that was just wrong. And one of the great problems of Brexit is that the British public, especially the Remainers, never really managed to make clear how much Britain actually benefits or benefited from Europe at the time. Leave voters, sociologists found out, are people from post-industrial regions where unemployment was high. Places that found it difficult to find a new economy and identity after the end of the industrial age. Joblessness in Britain tends to be concentrated in areas outside of London, particularly in the north, 
uh, and often in places where there's been deindustrialization. So there used to be manufacturing jobs which have left, uh, and it's mostly just retail, retail jobs, very precarious and low paying, uh, and very low skilling in those areas. The Brexiteers have addressed this frustration with their campaign. They are the quiet people, the silent majority. Andrew Johnston is an expert on medieval myth in English literature. He has also written a book on the legend of Robin Hood. Is there a connection between Brexit and the hero from Sherwood Forest? Yeah, in a way there is. Robin Hood, at least in the, in the early forms of his existence, in the medieval texts and uh, in the medieval legends, is very much a figure who is opposed to the powerful, who is opposed to the rich, who is opposed to elite culture. And you could say many people who voted for Brexit had the feeling, we have to show the powerful that we're here too. So they weren't actually always fighting against Brexit. They were fighting against the sense that we, the Northern English, had been abandoned by the rich Southerners. And in many ways, Robin Hood in Sherwood Forest is precisely that, a poor Northern Englishman who is fighting against the elites from the South. And so Robin Hood is much closer to the, what you might call the social origins of, the social and cultural origins of Brexit, as they are homemade in, in England, than one would think. The Daily Mail triumphs the day after the referendum. Take a bow, Britain. The quiet people of Britain rose up against an arrogant, out-of-touch political class and a contemptuous Brussels elite. That's how you divide. On the one side, the so-called little people, farmers and the working class. And on the other side, city people, young, well-educated, international, multi-ethnic. Similarly, you find that between generations, there was a big generational division between, often within families, of grandparents who would vote for leave and younger people who would vote for uh, remain. So it really split the country and it still feels as though there's this lasting division within British politics which had not existed years previously in which you identified yourself in terms of one of these tribes of remain and leave. The referendum has made the problem of deep division visible, but Brussels and the EU have nothing to do with it, rather the understanding of nationalism of some Britons.